to work in or manage the accounts payable function, you need to know a little bit about a lot of different things. One of those areas is accounting. While you certainly don't need a CPA to work in or manage accounts payable, you do need a certain minimal level of accounting knowledge. We put this session together to provide our community with the fundamental understanding of the accounting concepts that impact the accounts payable function. Stick around until the end when we discuss briefly what management expects you to do with, with this knowledge. Let's start out with the basics, a look at the differences between a debit and a credit. In accounting, these fundamental or basic terms underlie virtually all transactions. Basically, the term debit and credit are used to describe the movement of money in and out of your business account. Clearly, a strong understanding of debits and credits is an integral part of that responsibility. Now, before we get started, I want to talk about T accounts, something that you most of you will probably have heard of. It's referred to in double entry bookkeeping, and it is a graphical representation in the shape of, you guessed it, a T. Debit entries are depicted on the left of the T and credits are shown on the right. So what's a debit? A debit entry is a record of money being taken out of the account. For example, if you purchase new equipment for your business, you would debit the equipment account and credit the cash or bank account. Let's look at a real life example. Let's say you are a retail business and procurement just bought $75,000 worth of new widgets. You would debit your inventory account for $75,000 and credit your cash or bank account by a similar amount, the $75,000. Now, let's look at the reverse. A credit entry would be a record of the money being put into the account. So, for example, if a customer pays an invoice, you would credit the cash or the bank account and debit account the account's receivable account. Now, let's go back to our earlier example of those widgets you bought. Now you've sold them to your customer and your customers paid you $80,000 on an invoice that you sent 30 days earlier. You would credit your cash by $8,000 and debit your accounts receivable by also the $80,000. That's $80,000, okay, not $8,000. Of course, your customer would be doing the opposite with their cash and inventory accounts. But what you say, what you say about services? Let's say your business provides consulting services and a client pays you $20,000 for some of those consulting services. To record this transaction in your accounting records, you would debit the cash or bank account by $20,000 and credit the service revenue account by an equal amount of $20,000. This records the inflows of cash into your business and the recognition of the revenue for the service provided to the client. Remember that when one account is debited, another must be credited and vice versa. All entries are two-sided. This is because the total value of the assets, liabilities, and equity must always remain in balance. In short, debit means left side, credit means right side, and they always must balance out. Will, where you are going to put each of these debit and credit entries will depend on your chart of accounts for the general ledger. Let's look at some basics of, around what is a chart of accounts and the general ledger. While information is most frequently entered into the general ledger via a debit or a credit entry, as already discussed, sometimes that does not happen and a journal entry is need. What is a journal entry? Let's take a look. Some professionals get mixed up between what goes into accounts payable and what is considered an accrued expense. We don't want that to happen to you. So let's take a look at how the two differ. This information is compiled on financial state. There are three different reports, and if you want to have an intelligent conversation about your organization's financial results, it is important you understand what a statement of cash flow is, as well as what goes on the income statement and what goes on the balance sheet. So let's investigate. Once you understand the differences between these all important financial concepts, management may expect you to analyze some of the data. This is yet another area where those who work in or manage accounts payable are expected to have some rudimentary skills. That's why we created a short video on data analytics, which you can watch right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Good luck. What is the general ledger chart of accounts? Very simply put, the chart of accounts is the foundation of the accounting system and is used to organize and categorize all financial transactions in an organization. 
Now, of course, I'm making this topic seem a little bit more simplistic than it actually is. It's really a little bit more complicated. So let's take a deeper look. The general ledger is kind of your pillar of your accounting system that holds all the financial data for an organization. That data is subsequently used to create financial statements, budgets, and other management reports. It's the information your management team uses basically to run the organization. Before financial statements can be prepared, transactions are recorded and classified, organized, and indexed through various steps to make up the accounting system. The accounting system tallies events and changes to each account that compromise your financial statements. These accounts are listed in, drum roll please, the chart of accounts. These can be quite simple or they can be long and complex, especially in larger organizations. For this reason, account names are often associated with the account numbers, which may provide further information about the type of an account. A company may designate a few hundred account numbers for each type of account. These numbers are sometimes referred to as the GL code. Now, there's no limit on the range of account numbers. However, You should take care not to set up too many accounts. Having too many accounts makes it harder to see the big picture and also tends to take a lot of time to maintain. Your general ledger coding may be done by the accountant responsible for that activity or when we're talking about invoices in the accounts payable department. Now, here's how the process typically should work, all the way from recording of an individual transaction to preparing your financial statements. Transactions, as we said, are based on source documents and are recorded to the appropriate subledger, payroll, cash, inventory, receivables, fixed assets, payables, etc. Of course, your invoices are going to be to your payable subledger. The subledger activity is then posted as debits and pr- credits to the appropriate accounts in the general ledger. The listing of the account's name is also called chart of accounts. Getting a transaction into the general ledger can be done through a subledger, but it also can be done through a manual journal entry directed at the general ledger. It should be noted as an aside, as much as possible using journal entries should be discouraged. Now, some accounts payable departments have what they'll call the GL coding sheet or simply the GL cheat sheet. This is to make their process a little more efficient and run a little bit smoother. And basically, it's a list of the GL codes most commonly used in accounts payable for coding invoices. Now, before we go on, I want to give you a few definitions that you'll sometimes see, some shorthand, some jargon. And even though we encourage folks not to use jargon, you know, it slips in and there's nothing you can do about it. Sometimes you'll see the the letters GL, which simply stands for GL. And you've already heard me slipping into the jargon, even though I shouldn't be talking about GL coding, which of course simply means general ledger coding. The other abbreviation that you'll sometimes see is COA, capital C, small O, capital A. And not surprisingly, that stands for chart of accounts. Best practices for creating and managing your chart of accounts. Number one, when you're setting it up, Plan for the long term, so leave plenty of room to add new accounts if they're needed later on. Don't think you know exactly where your business is going because you'll add new products, new subsidiaries, a whole bunch of new stuff, and you want to make sure you have room to expand in your chart of accounts. You don't want to redo it every time you get a new business line. Best practice number two, be consistent and use simple names so that it's easily understandable and manageable by everyone. Best practice number three, don't go overboard in trying to segregate out all possible information that any Anyone within your organization might ever need. You want to be reasonable in setting up your individual accounts. And don't forget, you can set up sub accounts that will roll up into the account. So set up some reasonable accounts. You don't want to have to track every $5 that somebody might spend on, on something. Uh, best practice number four, if you haven't used an account in over a year, consider deleting it. But what you want to do is best practice number five is once a year do an annual review of all your accounts and see which ones no longer make sense and which ones it might be okay to combine. You know, you might have had a lot of activity in one area and now you, you don't have so much activity there. So maybe you can combine two or three of them rather than just have it go to miscellaneous or something like that. While information is most frequently entered into the general ledger via a debit or a credit entry, as already discussed, some Sometimes that does not happen and a journal entry is need. What is a journal entry? Let's take a look. A journal entry is a record of a business transaction in the accounting books of a business. 
Every transaction involves two journal entries, a debit and a credit. At its most basic level, the data includes the accounts affected and the corresponding amounts for both debits and credits. Sometimes a journal entry also includes a reference number, which may be referred to as a journal entry number. It may also include a brief description, if appropriate, and if the particular ERP permits it. Why are journal entries used? The purpose of a journal entry is to accurately record every business transaction. Journal entries are used for three reasons, and one unfortunately is not good. They are, one, to record the transactions as discussed, two, to fix errors in previously recorded transactions, and three, sadly, to fix the books while facilitating a fraud. Obviously, you want to avoid the last one at all costs. How to make a journal entry? Succinctly, debit money that flows into the account and a credit is the money that flows out of the account. Here's what you need to remember. A credit is always on the right side of a journal entry. It increases the owner's equity, liability, and revenue when credit. A debit, on the other hand, is always on the left side of the entry. It increases assets and expenses when debited. At the end of the journal entry, the credit and debit balance should equal each other. If they don't, double check because you've probably made a mistake. But that's not all. Adjusting entries are used to update previously recorded journal entries. They ensure that the recordings line up to the correct accounting periods. This does not mean that those transactions are deleted or erased, though. Adjusting entries are new transactions that keep the business finances up to date. They're usually made at the end of an accounting period. They include items like prepaid expenses, unearned revenue, accrued revenue, and your accounting software now will make the majority of your journal entries directly into the general ledger as you receive invoices and reconcile payment payments using linked business bank accounts, etc. Businesses may still need to make manual journal entries for month-end adjustments, depreciation expenses, and transactions that haven't used the business bank account. They might also include items like prepaid expenses, unearned revenue, accrued revenue, and accrued expense. Some professionals get mixed up between what goes into accounts payable and what is considered an accrued expense. We don't want that to happen to you. So let's take a look at how the two differ. Accounts payable and accrued expenses are two closely related topics, although in practice they are very different. Both are found on the balance sheet. Both are considered current liabilities, which, as you probably know, means they are due within 12 months. But that's where the similarities end. Let's start out with the definition of accounts payable. Here's how I explained it on a recent YouTube short. Accounts payable has both an accounting finance definition and a functional definition. Let's start with the accounting one. Accounts payable, often referred to as AP, is the amount of a company's total invoices currently waiting to be paid. These can be for either a product or a service and are typically due within 30 days after the receipt of the invoice. However, the payment terms can vary widely depending on what was negotiated and your industry. Accounts payable is considered a current liability on the balance sheet since almost always invoices are due in less than one year. From a functional standpoint, accounts payable refers to the team who gets the company's bills paid. In that instance, we were talking about the first definition, not the functional definition. This might be obvious to most watching this, but I do not want to confuse those who watch the almost 600 videos we have already posted, with more on the way, two in most weeks, and will continue to post, mostly having to do with the operational side of accounts payable and the insights needed to help professionals on an accounting or account payable job interview. Now let's turn our attention to accrued expenses. Accrued expenses are expenses that are incurred but not paid yet. Ultimately these expenses will increase accounts payable. Until that time they are carried under accrued expenses. As most listening to this are very well aware, GAAP, G-A-A-P, accounting requires accrual. Cash has been described by some as the lifeblood of an organization. 
the cash flow statement is one of the three main financial statements that focuses on this. For many organizations, managing cash flow is an issue that is discussed and reviewed on a weekly, if not daily basis. And as you might expect, Accounts payable is a critical component, for without adequate cash flow, paying vendors and employees is difficult. Definition. Let's start with the definition of what cash flow is. Make sure we're all on the same page. The statement of cash flow explains how much cash has come in and how much cash has gone out during the set period usually a year, but it can be something else. It also, also details the sources as well as the uses of cash during the period covered by the statement. It can be monthly or quarterly, or as I said, annually. I've been involved in this intense situations, i.e. where there were financial difficulties and the statement was prepared and reviewed on a daily basis, but that is not typical. The daily cash yeah. calendar. The daily cash calendar is different than the statement of cash flows and is used in some companies, primarily in their treasury operations, to manage cash. Typically, the cash calendar is used to manage cash where there are many items of cash coming in. Think maturing investments, both short and long term, as well as going out. This activity will often have one line item for cash flow that is generated by operations. Now, I don't want to get off topic by talking about cash calendars. So if you want me to do uh, another video on cash calendars, let me know in the comments and we can do a separate talk on it. Back to statement of cash flow. We're going to talk now about the components. The first item on the statement of cash flow is typically the opening balance, i.e. how much cash was left over from the prior period. Cash and cash equivalents, by the way. It will be the closing uh, cash position from the prior period. Activity is broken down into three very broad categories, although not every organization will have coming cash coming in for all categories, as you'll see. Okay, these categories include number one, cash flow from operations. This will represent the net of the funds from operating the, the business. Very simply put, it might include sales, donations, fees paid for, to the company, etc. This is netted against the expenses related to this activity. Those expenses might include things like salaries, purchase of raw materials that are used in manufacturing, utilities, etc. When many people think of cash flow, they only focus on cash flow from operations. But this does not always provide a clear picture, especially in those instances where there is a lot of financing involved. Think LBOs, leveraged buyouts. In those cases, um, that, that area plays a critical role, often casting a dark shadow over other activity that the organization would like to pursue. Okay, second component, cash flow from investments. Investment activity will include interest earned, if there is any, sale of investments, as well as funds spent on new investments. It too can get quite complicated. Viewers and listeners should be aware that in this section, you will often see big assets that were purchased by the company to run the business. This might include machinery, equipment, and possibly even the purchase of another com company. Now, before we get to the component that often makes good statements of cash flow look bad, if you found this video helpful, don't forget to hit that like button and share it with your colleagues. If you want to keep up with the latest in accounts payable and payment processes, best practices, fraud protection, etc., make sure you, you subscribe to the AP Now channel and hit that notification bell so you won't miss any new videos. And by the way, we have someone helping you find a job. The last component, cash flow from financing activities. This is where you will see if a company has issued new shares, taken a bank loan, paid difference dividends. There will only be activity in this area if the organization borrows money, both in long and short term as reflected here. It will include both loan proceeds received as well as interests paid and loans repaid. This can be a positive or negative number. For example, if in the given time period the company only paid interest on the loans but not, did not receive any borrowings, it would only reflect the outgoing of funds. But if the company had a new loan and received the funds, this might offset all the interest paid. Obviously, 
I'm making it very simple and it can get quite complicated. In those rare instances, and they occur, where there are no borrowings, there would be no activity reflected in this area. The statement of cash flow will then show the increase or decrease in cash and cash equivalents during the period and then the ending cash position. I want to point out one thing to be aware of when it comes to statements of cash flow. Most companies are on an accrual basis for preparing their income statements and balance sheets. However, if your organization is on a cash basis, then your income statement and your statement of cash flow will be the same. The accounting professionals who are listening will be quick to point out that GAAP, G-A-A-P, requires accrual accounting. So at the very end of the statement of cash flow, you will see a reconciliation to the balance sheet. What is the balance sheet for starters? A balance sheet is a financial statement that reports the company's assets, liabilities, and shareholders or owner's equity at any specific point in time. A balance sheet provides a snapshot of what a company owns and owes, as well as the amounts invested by shareholders at a particular point in time, usually the end of the fiscal year or some other fiscal period, either monthly or quarterly or whatever. You may hear some discussion about a balance sheet equation. In those cases, the speaker is usually referring to the basic equation that states assets equals liability plus owner's equity. Occasionally, you will see this equation in another form. Specifically, liabilities equal assets minus owner's equity. You will sometimes see owner's equity referred to as shareholder's equity. How is the balance sheet used? There are several ways the balance sheet is used depending on who is doing the looking. Internally, the management team will look at the balance sheet to monitor the health of the organization. They will use this information then to drive activity, hoping to correct mistakes early before they cause too much of a problem. And they do the opposite when there's a success. Investors and lenders look at the balance sheet when determining whether to invest or lend, using it to determine profitability, and more importantly, at least to the lenders, liquidity, i.e. will the organization have the adequate funds to service loans, and more specifically, any new loans that they may make to an organization. An investor, especially one considering buying company stock, will be interested to see if there is adequate liquidity to continue paying dividends. Using the balance sheet, let's take a look at some of the basic analytical comparisons typically made based on data from the balance sheet. We're going to start with the current ratio. This measures the liquidity of the organization and its ability to meet its short-term obligation. It is calculated by taking current assets and dividing them by current liabilities. In an ideal world, the resulting number would be greater than one. But even for some well-known companies, it is often below one. The following are considered current assets, cash and cash equivalents, inventory, accounts receivable, and any other assets that can be converted into cash within one year. The following are considered current liabilities, accounts payable, short-term debt, and the current portion of long-term debt. Next, we're going to look at the quick ratio. This measures the organization's ability to pay off its current liabilities using its liquid assets. It is calculated by dividing quick assets by current liability. What's a quick asset? Cash and cash equivalents, accounts receivable, and other short-term assets. Likewise, current liabilities are the same as used in calculating the current ratio. Basically, the quick ratio removes inventory and the disposal of the inventory from the equations. There are many reasons for this, many of which you probably figured out yourself. Yeah. The balance sheet is always based on the past. It says nothing about the future. That's why you will frequently see a warning for investors stating that past performance is no guarantee of future performance or success. Now let's talk about the accounts payable connect. Current liabilities are considered any obligation due within one year. Hence, accounts payable will be included in the current liabilities figure along with things like rent, payroll, etc. Now let's turn our attention to the income statement. Why does an income statement? One of the easiest ways to remember what an income statement is, I think, is that to think of it as a profit and loss statement. Income statement, profit and loss statement. Specifically, it reports on the revenue, expenses, gains, and losses for the reporting company for a specific period of time. The most common periods of time are the fiscal year, which may or may not be the same as the calendar year or quarterly statements. It focuses on four separate areas, revenue, expenses, gains, and losses. 
although of course everyone is hoping that there will only be three due to having no losses. How is the income statement used? For starters, business owners can use the income statement to see if their plans and investments have paid off. It also helps them identify any unplanned for expense. Lenders will use the income statement to decide whether the business is loan worthy, while investors will use it to determine if it meets their investment criteria. Creditors use the income statement to check whether the company has enough cash flow to pay for goods that it might order from them, pay off its loans, or take out a new loan. Now let's take a look at some of the basic analysis typically made based on data from the income statement. There are two types of analysis commonly used with income statements, a vertical analysis and a horizontal analysis. Let's take a look at each. With a vertical analysis, each line item in the statement is listed as a percentage of the base amount. So line items on the income statement are now expressed as percentages of gross sales rather than the precise dollar amount. Vertical analysis makes it simpler to compare financial statements between companies across industries and time periods. You can use it to assess whether performance indicators are getting better or worse. Conversely, horizontal analysis compares changes in the dollar amounts in the company's financial statements over multiple periods. While it is usually used in absolute comparisons, it can be used as percentages. The horizontal analysis makes financial data and reporting consistent per generally accepted accounting principles, otherwise known as GAAP. There is sometimes a debate over which approach is better. The answer is simple. Combining both will give you the insights you need to make whatever decisions and analysis are employed. Now let's look at the accounts payable connection. Accounts payable per se does not show up on the income statement. However, they are closely related, if you will, as the income statement shows expenses. Now, before we discuss how the balance sheet and income statement are related, and they are, if you are getting value from this discussion, both YouTube and I would appreciate it if you'd hit the like or the thumbs up button to let us know so that YouTube can share it with more people and I can know to create more content like this. A big thank you from me to everyone who did so. I appreciate your insight. How are the balance sheet and income statement related and interconnected? Obviously, they both help both internal and external parties evaluate the financial health of the company in question. They complement each other in presenting a clear picture and understanding of the financial operations of a company. But there is even a closer tie. Remember that balance sheet equation discussed earlier? Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. They kind of beat it into your head in business school, but I digress over that. Profits generated in the income statement get added to the owner's equity on the balance sheet as retained earnings. Also, debt on the balance sheet is used to calculate interest expense in the income statement. I have a little balance sheet and income statement trivia for you, unless you already know that. In which case, please feel, feel free to let us know in the comments. But I'll bet most of you don't know who created the first balance sheet and who created the first income statement? I'll give you a hint. He was also a mathematician. No, it was not Leonardo da Vinci, although he was a good friend. It was Friar Luca, Luca Bartolomeo de Pacioli. I had to practice that. Yes, that's right, he was a friar. He described the double entry accounting method used in parts of Italy in 1494. Yes, you heard correctly. This revolutionized how business oversaw their operations and is still in use over 500 years later. He is considered the father of modern accounting. Once you understand the differences between these all important financial concepts, management may expect you to analyze some of the data. This is yet another area where those who work in or manage accounts payable are expected to have some rudimentary skills. That's why we created a short video on data analytics, which you can watch right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Good luck.